everyone. Hello, how are you? Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so excited about this. Um, this is our second web series, and so I'm going to introduce our guest moderator, who will then introduce our guest designers that we have this week. But first, a little bit about myself. I am um, a former interior designer, and I now work with Schumacher as a team lead for Northern California. So I'm I'm part of the team that's organized this web series and gets to meet all of these lovely ladies um, in advance. So a little bit about our guest moderator. We have Gail Davis joining us again. Um, Gail is known for creating chic polished spaces that deftly layer vintage components with contemporary pieces and striking color palettes with doses of strong pattern. Her rooms are all at once welcoming and refined. Her successful career in fashion um, at Saks Fifth Avenue <clears throat> um, led her to uh, eventually work with Bunny Williams and David Kleinberg before founding her own design firm. Her work has been celebrated by House Beautiful, AD Pro, Domino, and more. And she also hosts a phenomenal podcast called Designing Sp Perspectives, which she launched last week. Thank you, Gail, so much for um, joining us again today as our guest moderator. I'll hand the mic over to you so you can introduce our guest um, designers. Okay, thank you so much. Um, welcome everybody. Happy Tuesday afternoon, even though it feels like it's um, Can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi, you can hear, okay, there we go. I can see everybody, everyone's beautiful face. So today, um, I have four amazing women with me. I can call them all my friends, super excited. We're gonna have fun with this. Now we're gonna to toast at the end because this has been a trying day, I guess, for all. Um, first up is Joy Moiler. I'm going to read everyone's bio. Is known for rooms that are once welcoming and chic, marked by strong forms, luxe finishes, and thoughtful de details. In her more than 25 years in the industry, Joy has worked with everyone from Ralph Lauren and John Saladino to Skidmore Owings and Merrill and Khan Peterson Fox and she was the lead US designer for the Giorgio Armani Interior Design Studio. Joy has designed spaces for a who's who's list of clients, including Leonardo DiCaprio, Harry Winston, and David Geffen, to name just a few. And in 2019 was selected for both Elle Decor's A-list and the Hollywood Reporter's list of top 20 designers. She's currently working on a wide range of projects, including a seaside villa in Portofino, Italy, a private apartment in Paris, Paris's Hotel Plaza Athene and a golf course, well, a golf club, golf course club or golf club <laughs> in Moscow that features a Jack Nicholas design course. Uh, next up is Beth Diana Smith or BDS Studios. <laughs> Creates supremely stylish uh, spaces that effortlessly blend influences, cultures and eras. Her dynamic use of color and statement making, excuse me, statement making art combined with her insistence that rooms be both fun and functional have made her highly sought after for a wide range of clients. After a successful career in corporate finance, Beth pivoted to interior design and she's been blazing a trail in our industry ever since. She's been featured on HGTV and NBC as well as in such publications as House Beautiful, El Decor, and Real Simple, and is regularly selected for New York City's taste-making annual Design on a Dime fundraiser, where her booths are always among the most hotly anticipated. Next up is my friend Enea White. She has fresh designs, modern rooms, with a classic sensibility and an irresistible dose of glam. She received her Bachelor of Fine Arts in Interior Design from the Art Institute of Washington after working in Los Angeles and Washington, D.C absorbing the unique aesthetics of both locations she settled in New York City and launched, and launched Ineo White Interiors in 2018. She has been featured in such publications as Domino, House Beautiful, and Duel. And don't miss her video on House Beautiful, House Beautiful, excuse me, featuring Dollhouse Project that she did for them. It was super fun and amazing. Quintel Gwynn, here we go. Designs <laughs> exuberant spaces infused with sophistication and warmth. She holds a BS in interior design and an MA in interior architecture and design. 
and started her career at a firm working on large scale commercial and residential projects. She established Quinn Gwen Studio in 2014. She worked with leading brands such as Restoration Hardware and Pottery Barn and launched a home stylist program for West Elm stores across the country. She's been featured in such publications as Charlotte Magazine and Charlotte Home Design and Decor and is passionate about arts, design, and community, community advocate. Welcome, ladies. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today. So, Joy, I'm going to start with you. Uh-oh. <laughs> You're in the hot seat. Tell us how you got started and how you were able to build such an amazing and uh, just a well thought out successful career with like amazing people. You have some great clients. Well, I thank you. Thank you for that introduction. I think <laughs> that I'm blessed to have great clients because you know, design is a business. And the most important thing about business is knowing when to speak and when, knowing when not to. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, I'm blessed to work with celebrity clients and HNW clients who appreciate, you know, my, my ability to keep my mouth shut and not talk about what I see a lot. Um, and the key point I think to uh, my career is, um, that I'm well studied in various uh, design styles, which provides me an opportunity to work on a wide range of projects, uh, particularly with clients who might have five or six homes who like to do different things in different residences. And I'm able to do multiple projects for, for them because I have a background with doing different styles. And every time they go on a vacation somewhere, they want to do something else in a different house so uh but i mean I, I i put my put my time and i paid my dues i worked till three in the morning for one and a half years straight at skidmore owings and merrill and just grind it you know just total total work total work putting the time in and i think that is the thing that makes the most um that's the most important thing to clients. They want to know that you put the time in, that you know what you're talking about. Because if they do have multiple residences, they've been through the design situation before. You aren't telling them anything that they don't know. And they mm -hmm. will check you uh, and make sure that you know what you're talking about. So that's it. And just really putting the time in and grinding. No sleep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think we're all team no sleep at several times. Uh, Beth, I want to ask you, what is the key for you to building a thriving design business and how do you find your clientele? Beth, can you hear me? Quinn, can you hear me? Yes. You can? Okay, well, I'll go with Quinn because um, how, how do you find your clientele and how do you thrive with them? Or how, do you, how, did, you, how did you get your business to thrive and just like really keep your foot on the pulse there and, and go your finger on the pulse. Well, I entered the industry uh, at the college. I went straight into the architecture industry. Um, mm -hmm. So design being nestled in that industry uh, sometimes has a unique spin on the type of projects. And so I was fortunate to work on a lot of commercial and large scale spaces. And um, when the recession 09 hit, it kind of took me out <laughs> and a lot of us with it. Uh, and at the time I was relocating and I had a very strong uh, background in technical skill um, and construction. And that at the time set, I feel set me apart um, from some of my design peers um, that were doing more residential work. I was able to connect with developers and builders and start off in a space similar to where I had come from. Um, mm -hmm. And then I was in a city like Charlotte that's booming, busy, growing, and a lot of construction. So for me, it was really understanding that side of the business um, and that process. And what I will say is learning at a very early age how important relationships are and really understanding how collaborative this work is. I think one of the misconceptions is seeing celebrity designer status um, as if there's these little, there's a designer and then these L's that are helping and not really understanding <laughs> the other professions that come into play into executing our work and the type of collaboration so it's like, that yes. happens. 
to finish throughout the thread of our work. So. No, it's, it's true. HGTV makes it seem like, you know, poof, done in a day. And you're like, no, no, there's a lot of lot that goes on behind the scenes. Beth, you've been on TV, TV several times and you had your show. What was the biggest challenge for you? And did you get clients from that? And were you able to grow and have your business explode from that? Oh, you're on mute for some reason. Oh, it says mute now. Mm -mm. I think she's okay. Beth, can you hear you? I can't hear her. Me either. Okay, then. Yes, now we can hear you. <laughs> Sorry. My phone rang and it threw all the audio off. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I was just talking to her. Wait, Beth, Beth? Technology. <laughs> Okay, so it's a, it's a bit of a mix. I have, def I would say I got more clients from my appearances on Open House NYC than mm -hmm. I did from being on HGTV. And I'm actually getting my preferred clients from Open House NYC. It really just boils down to what my preferred client is. And they seem to more watch to to watch a lot more of open house than they do of HGTV. Okay. The client who's, I think it was the nursery you did in green. Was that from open house? That was, oh my God. Were they, do they, I think they, with them, I can't remember it was open house or if it was from Instagram. Uh huh. Um, but they reached out specifically because of my aesthetic. So I feel like either way, if they're following me from, from Instagram mm -hmm. or from Open House, you're seeing really me. What appeared on HGTV was not my aesthetic and not my preferred okay. style. Okay, that's fine. Oh, uh, Inea, how are you, my friend? I'm doing well. How are you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So let's talk about your business because people can find you on Instagram and you are ruthless with the Instagram. Like you are just, every time I turn on, you're like doing something, showing some, something. Your sketches are amazing. How are you allowing your business to thrive from that? How are you finding your clients? Are your clients finding you actually on your Instagram stories? And are you growing your business more from there or is it from one-on-one? -on -one? You tell me. I think like Joy mentioned, people want to know that you know what you're doing. So mm -hmm. I try to leverage, like Quinn said, my background. I can do construction drawings. Let me do a time lapse of me sitting here at 2 a.m. And then they're like, oh, she can do this. She can do that. How she learned that? Let me look her up. Let me go find out how she knows what she knows. And then by that time, they're knee deep in content and growing an obsession with just the life of Instagram and what it's like to design in New York. So I think that's been my spin, like kind of like lifestyle meets a little bit of influencing meets what the design world actually is. It's beyond the pretty room. Like, let me show you what we actually do, like how we sweat, why we sweat and what it looks like in the end. So that's been my Instagram has definitely been a business builder for me. Okay. And do, when you log on to your Instagram, does it also go over to your Facebook or do you just do solely Instagram? There's a, sometimes I get notifications that there's life on Facebook, but honestly, I forget. It's definitely a different market on Facebook. Yeah. I yeah. try to completely forget about it, but Instagram is my bread and butter. Okay. That's cool. That's good. So, um, Mentorship. Let's talk about mentorship. I'm just trying to figure out which way I want to go with this because this is important for me. When I got my mentorship at Bunny Williams, it was very different. What I thought design was, and then when I worked there, I got to see what it really was. That it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of behind the scenes. It's a lot of grunt work. And it's, you know, what you get to at the end is all beautiful, but getting there is really grueling at times. So, I'm sure, well, and I know Joy, you do, because you kind of mentor me, <laughs> you mentor all of us. Um, when you mentor people, what is it that you're working with them and what are you trying to fine tune in them or make them aware of? And who were your mentors that motivated you? And I'll start again with Joy. 
Yeah, uh, from the beginning, from the very beginning, uh, one of my most cherished mentors was a gentleman by the name of Davis Allen. He worked at Skidmore Owings and Merrill. We were there at the same time and he was a much older gentleman and he was famous for designing furniture for Stendig and just a supreme interior designer and the perfect gentleman. And he really just took me under my wing, my third week at Skimmer Owings and Merrill and just taught me so much about the production of furniture, the process of furniture. Uh, I had a second mentor uh, at Skimmer Owings and Merrill, also another gentleman by the name of Michael McCarthy, who was a partner and one of the most fastidious interior designers I've ever met in my entire life. And he was an absolute perfectionist and he was totally obsessed uh, that I know the difference between Makaroi Pomele and Sapelli and all these sorts of things and just finishes and mortise tenon joints. And he would send me off to find something. And if he wanted something that was, you know, Elizabethan or Rococo or whatever, you better bring back the right thing. And the punishment <laughs> for not bringing back the right thing was, he would show me an image of something somewhere and I would have to draw it upside down with him sitting across the table. And so to this day, I draw elevations upside down with clients sitting on the other side of the table from that training. Um, so I, I mean, I saw it as an absolute gift uh, at the time, because I used to complain to my dad all the time, they're killing me. But my dad was always like, you'll appreciate it later. And so my thing with mentors, or rather with interns, I work my interns to death. And I'll tell them, come, you know, research. I want a console, but I want something with more than mortise tenon joints. And I want it to be real chagrin or lighted with, you know, onyx. And it's got to have screws that are number nine screws. And I insist that, you know, they bring this back. I think it's part of their development and training that they have to dig deep. Just don't go on Instagram and find me a table, you know, or something like that. So, and when I was with uh, Giorgio Armani, the head of the design studio, I used to get in trouble all the time with HR because they would say, well, interns, they're not really supposed to work. <laughs> leaving them and I thought you know what? the real world is about work it isn't about oh let me sit in the corner and yeah have a nice magazine picture and give it to you now bring that thing back and so I tend to be really hard on people because I just feel that education in your field and your craft is exceptionally important I don't want to work with uh someone who's an interior design enthusiast who think mm. they might want to get into interior design because I don't want to go to a cardiologist enthusiast, you know, <laughs> to, you know, have a heart transplant or something, right? So I, it's really important to me mm. to work with people who are really about this business, who put the time in where education is a priority. If this is what you're intending to do for the rest of your life, you better take some classes you know, because clients know the difference. They know it hard and they may not say anything, but they know it, they know it all. Can I, can I just say that's so interesting when you speak to people today and especially, you know, when they're like, I'm a designer and you're like, okay, where'd you go to school? It seems to a lot of, to me, a lot of people are like, well, school's not important, but I was like, you still need the foundation and you still need to understand what you're doing. I mean, you just can't, just go out there and just because you can pick colors and put them together, it doesn't make you a designer, you're a decorator. And what I say to that is fine, don't go to school. I'll, those clients are coming to me because they know that I've, you know, worked put 30 years in and know multiple styles. So I say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go learn interior design from Instagram and looking at a couple <laughs> of magazines. That's good for my business. <laughs> Beth, what do you have to say to that? Because your face is just making all these expressions. I can't help because I love Joy, so I'm just, I'm just like enjoying listening to her taking speech, it in, taking it in. Um, first, let me give the disclaimer that I know some amazing designers who have not gone to school for interior design. Right. But for me, but for someone who came from a background of corporate finance and accounting, 
obviously my personality likes technical stuff. So when mm -hmm. I decided, when I thought, you know, I, I'm going to make interior design a side hustle, because I was not supposed to be doing this full time, I was just supposed to be in corporate finance. <laughs> um, I went back to school nights and weekends. I went to New York School Interior Design. And again, nights and weekends until I got a degree. But that's because I like that technical education. I wanted to know the history. I wanted to surround myself with other people who were learning the same way that I was and then listening to a professor. I wanted to learn codes. That was for me, but that's just my personality. Once I realized that this was something that I wanted to actually do and not mm -hmm. chase that very delicious corporate paycheck anymore, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I, was, I was very happy that I had already started the process of going to school because at the end of the day, my corporate job paid for most of my interior design degree. So right. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of the hustle. You got to work the hustle. Work the hustle. Right. So for me, I think it's really, really important. Um, I have never worked for someone else in interior design. So I went from being in school and launching a business to figuring out a lot on my own, but also building relationships. So I can ask those questions like I, do you have a recommendation for this? Um, but it's also about give and take. And uh, part of when I was listening to Joy speak, I think what's really important that I kind of want to highlight is even if you choose to go to school or not, um, and you are looking for someone to mentor you, because I, I get the emails and I get the DMs, someone will be willing to help you if you're coming from a place of giving versus receiving. Please don't send any more DMs. Hey, how did you start building your relationship with vendors? Can I get a salutation? <laughs> Say something. Um, it's really about <laughs> it's really about how you how you speak to someone. So I think that's really really important to to keep in mind that approach someone how you want to be approached because people are willing to help yeah. you if you need it, but just got to be sweet about it. This is true. Um, jumping to sweetness, not not that you're not sweet, Quinn. I want to speak to Anaya about, <laughs> no, I, I want to, I'm going to get to you, Quinn, but I want to speak to Anaya because she does some amazing sketches. And when Joy said that she sketches upside down, I'll never forget Professor Harding from NYSA did that to me. And I was just so gobsmacked watching this man talk to us and right side up to us. It, I mean, just sketching and it was all perfect. I'm like, how do you do that? So Anaya, do you sketch upside down? <laughs> You know, when Kim mentioned it, I think there might have been a time in class where, and my mentorship started back in college, so I'm pretty sure there was a moment when it was introduced and they just said, you know, you're going to have to get your clients on board with your idea. And sometimes that's in a meeting or on a construction site. So drawing on the draw, drywall, like what your vision is, or when you're sitting at a dining room table and they're looking at you like they have no idea what you're talking about, it comes down to a sketch. So 100% I sketch for my clients not necessarily upside down it sounds like a fun exercise <laughs> um mentorship who who has who was your mentor that inspired you and do you mentor do you have interns i've had an intern. i have had an intern i think my biggest uh what i like to give to people is that it's okay not to know all the answers but it's up to you to go find them so sure. You know, if you don't know the thickness of a, a wall, go figure it out. Go look it up. Go check out a book. Go to a project site and walk through. Um, and then like Beth said, you have to give. Give your time. Give what knowledge you do have. Just give of yourself. And this industry is a lot of hustle. And you're always learning every day. You can never know everything. So um, as far as mentors, though, back in college, that was the foundation. So if you didn't know the answer, they wouldn't tell me. It, Go measure the height of a doorknob. Go measure the height of a door switch. Um, just things like that that got me thinking what this industry would really be about. And then I pass that on to anyone that comes into my life, whether it's a DM or email, just letting them know that that's really what the core of this business is. It's always learning. Always be learning. This is true. I think too many people come into this thinking like it's all fun and games and it's, 
once again, just joy, um, joy, joy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just saying. So Quinn, how is it? How is it for you in Charlotte? Because it's booming. Business is crazy out there. How are you growing your business? And are you doing all new construction, or are you doing some renovation? A lot of renovation in the form of adaptive reuse. So I've got a lot of commercial based um, spaces, old churches. Uh, it's about three projects on the boards now that are turning, converting old churches into community space centers, tech hubs. Um, so that's that's um, exciting. Uh, but it also it leads me um, into my thoughts and remarks on uh, how I approach mentorship. And it's funny that you were like, I, it's not that you're not sweet because I'm a very fun <laughs> down to Mars girl. But when it comes to business, I am all business. And so like Beth mentioned, I do have people reach out to me all the time with DMs and emails. Um, I have a large uh, pool of college students that are looking to fulfill their internship requirements. Just last summer, I had an intern from Iowa State come for the summer for nine weeks to fulfill her internship requirements. And so one of the ways that I've started to respond or approach the mentorship conversation is hearing somebody out first in that first minute, but then pushing the questions back on them. Because I like to remind people like, this is a mixture of coaching, construction knowledge and business. And so before we even talk about what you might want to do or what you may or may not be able to offer, we have to like realize and, and, and through one another and through your personal individual approach to the work, think about whether or not you're coachable. Some people are not ready to be coached. Um, people are not in the mindset of working underneath someone. Um, mm -hmm. I've had interns that were 20, 30, 40 something. So just reaching across the gamut and realizing that it depends on where people are. So I like to, to probe them with questions like that. Um, I also do my best to acknowledge and highlight the parametric differences between educational um, experiences and real world experiences. I don't think that people that are um, thinking to get into this industry or under, under their studies realize how vast and different it is when you're in a learning space versus being in a real work space and you're dealing with people's personal lives and budgets. It's, it's really not a game. And so yeah. the other thing that I try to get people who reach out to me to think about is um, an internship and apprenticeship um, has work related or work situationships attached to it. But mentorship is often about personal growth and professional development. And that's a very different thing to take on. And so I am very quick to be upfront and honest. If I don't have the bandwidth, I'm a wife and mother of three. I don't want to waste a lot of time. And so when I'm looking for the personality that might map onto the work, I'm looking for the grit. Um, right. I'm looking for the person who, like Beth and Joy and Anita, is serious about their studies. Because when we get yeah. up here on these and we're making decisions in the public realm, um, and I think that that's a key factor too. In sometimes people are coming, um, wanting to come into the profession, but they have a very narrow scope. You know, mm. they're thinking residential, and they're like, they're asking me what types of projects I could put them onto. And I'm like, well, we're a business, and I have a different background, and so I have a different type of clientele. Sometimes I don't have a one on one client, I literally have a board of directors where I'm firing right. off and answering and presenting to seven, eight people at a time. And it's mm. a different level of pressure, a different way to operate in the industry. And so I'm just very serious and direct about it about what I can take on. But also when I do take on mentors, I am passionate about growing up people and developing people in the industry. So I see them through to the end. I see my interns graduate. I had a young girl who was a um, high schooler, a middle college high schooler here, and she just graduated in May. And she's going on to UNC for interior architecture, making sure that we're pushing yes. people through as they are pushing themselves. So. It's a serious situation on both ends, and I just think both parties got to be ready. No, that's true. We have a little bit more time in North Carolina than we do up here. <laughs> <laughs> Joy, I have a question for you. Like, how do you, how do you get your clientele, and especially your clients, if one is in Russia and the other one's in Santa Barbara and the other's in Dubai, how do you decide who comes first or is the scope of the project or... 
Uh, it depends upon a few things which intertwine schedule, budget, logistics, travel. If I have to go to Europe and be in Italy, I'll make sure I go to London at the same time. If I have to go to Russia, I make sure I stop in Paris or London on the mm -hmm. way back. And then if I'm doing projects on the West Coast, I work on projects on the West Coast, but I have to, it's about structuring the day. So I usually get up around 3 a.m., start looking at my phone for the Russian emails because there are you know, a whole bunch of hours before and then up until about two o'clock in the afternoon, I'm working on uh, international correspondence. And then as they start to shut down, I start working on domestic communications. So it makes for a very, very long day. But uh, having been at Giorgio Armani, I was very fortunate there to gather uh, quite a many celebrity clients, Leo DiCaprio and John Mayer and Adrian Brody from there because I worked closely with uh, Roberta Armani, who is the head, worldwide head of uh, entertainment. And then when I left Armani, she essentially turned over um, that list to me of friends of the house. Uh, right. And that's how I've been able to continue doing multiple projects with a lot of those existing clients. So here's a question for all, and I don't know who I want to start with first, because everyone has a, a, we have different level of clientele here, and we also have different level of budgets, but I'm pretty sure that we have all run into people who wanted something and everything they wanted wasn't in the number that they were telling us. <laughs> Beth, no? How do you handle um, that? I tell them that what they want is not within their budget. Um, and I'll usually give, I'll usually give two examples, either the kitchen budget or the living room budget, just for them to understand. And I'll use a super low number, like, okay, outside of we're talking about my fee, let's, let's not say we're not even doing a renovation, right? We're just going to act like we're just doing decorating. Because I want them to think at the lowest possible level. If okay. you need, uh, if we need window treatments, if we need a sofa, if we need an area rug, if we need furniture, if we need art, if we need everything to get your whole magazine ready, and I'm just listing everything off, based on what your style is, then I'm going to estimate that your living room is going to be somewhere between twenty and 30000 But And let's say they said their budget is 5000 yes. You can't afford to do your living room. I can't think of a room that you can do for five thousand, and that's the reality of it. So I've I've now learned like I've now I have a budget minimum that I kind of like list on their client questionnaire, so I can kind of like weed those types of things out. Um, but I'll do the discovery call, and then I will explain to them based on what you're looking for, you should expect to spend this. And a lot of it, I realize some of them are low balling because they sometimes they just don't know. Mm -hmm. Which is fine. It's like, I don't know how much a car costs because I'm not buying a car every year, but I can right. definitely tell you <laughs> <laughs> it's not $5, how much a yard of fabric is. So it, yeah. it's those types of things. So it's a lot of education, but I will just let them know that from the gate because I don't want them to waste my time and I don't want to waste theirs. True. Ineo, what about you with your clientele? How do you talk budget with them? The same, but making it an educational moment. So when they send me that inspiration picture, and a lot of my clients lately have been on the younger side, so mm -hmm. I'll get inspiration music videos. The latest was the Drake video, and they said, this is my inspiration. And I said, okay, that $10,000 number that you gave me won't work, but here's why. You have really expensive taste. That sofa, you love it so much because it's custom, and it has everything about it is well beyond the number you quoted. So let's backtrack and look at some inspiration and get feedback that way. So just making it a fun educational moment and really pulling from their inspiration and figuring out how we can arrive there. Or maybe it's instead of doing your whole house, let's just focus on one room you're gonna spend a lot of time in. Are you adverse to doing one room at a time or do you want the whole project, the whole house? Well, eventually I would love the whole house, but the bulk of my clients right now are young first time home buyers, young families, and I'm content starting there. It'll be great to do a whole estate one day or a client's in Russia. 
Um, <laughs> I'm completely fine with one room. We can get comfortable. They can find the money while I'm working and then we can move forward. Perfect. What about you, Quinn? How do you handle budget with your clients? Well, I love to use that initial consultation to really get to the meat of things. Um, a lot like Beth mentioned, being able to assess their aesthetic and what they're going for and off the bat say, here's a ballpark figure that you may or may not be able to do this thing um, based on what, what you're wanting to do. Um, but also, like Anaya mentioned, approaching it from an educational, so it's not about feeling like you can't have something, you don't deserve it, but just being straight with the numbers, straight about design fees and my process and how we work as a team so that you understand where all of the costs are coming from um, and being very transparent in outlining a proposal. I think that people have experienced um, distrust and dishonesty in the industry from designers and also content contractors and so a lot of times at first I used to think like wait what are these people thinking I'm going to do this for nothing and then I, I'm learning that uh, people have just kind of been burned and not are in, a, are in a space where sometimes they don't know and so I just do my business about keeping it business and putting all of that up front not being afraid to talk about numbers off the rip going in with the thought that listen all things need to be above the table and I feel mm -hmm. like when I do that and approach it that way I follow up with a proposal a lot of times I I don't hear from people till about two months, but by the time I hear from them, they got all the money and we're ready to go. So I think it's a win -win. I mean, I'll wait a little bit, but I ain't got to dress my bag up and we keeping it a buck. It ain't no questions, you know? So, yes. Listen, you guys, what do you want to share with that, Joy? That is, I love her. I love her. when you are the best. You are keeping it 100 and that's what it is. This business is not for the faint of heart. And you have to have very hard conversations with people when they come to you and be realistic about what is. I just sent you ladies last night the thing about, you know, friends and family want you to do it for free or they want you to do it as a hookup. And I tell people when they ask me that, I'm like, Chase Mortgage is not a hookup. My car note's not a hookup. <laughs> the light bill's not a hookup. I, ha I work, this is a business. I'm present, you know, I'm presenting everything to you. You got to pay for it. This is what it is. Let's move ahead. Joy, what do you have to say about that? <laughs> Either at the fish and tackle shop or the knitting <laughs> shop. <laughs> also, Gail, in the spirit of keeping it 100, really, because I know my peers are watching this. So there's that conversation, too. In the industry, how we're pricing, mm. how we're undercutting. Um, and how we're all moving collectively as professionals is representative on the industry as a whole. So I try to encourage my peers to overcome the, the, comp, the lack of confidence that they may have around going in, leading with numbers, leading with the contract, leading with the, the business hat versus trying to be personable and be cool um, because it reflects on all of us. So it's a, it's a real thing. And it it's really, I think it's ahead, really important to come in early with the numbers to give people an, a general idea. Uh, even, I mean, as interior designers, it's not our role to really price things with respect to construction because we're not supposed to do that. And I really don't want to do it anyway. So <laughs> we have to be really, really careful about that because with respect to construction or even interiors as well, change orders are extremely expensive. Mm. If a custom sofa and you've got someone like Jonas or Atelier Jouf working on the sofa and that sofa is $25,000 and you aren't clear about the construction uh, of that sofa and it ends up being $50,000, you know, nobody's going to eat that difference if you haven't been clear about the cost of things. So you've got to be really, really, you know, get those estimates and those quotations and make sure you've got the filling down to the absolute specification, you know, what the webbing is going to be, what the details are, the bullion, all of that stuff. No joke. Or you'll be paying for it another bullion. What is the most yeah. valuable lesson that you learned with a client, Joy? Uh, that my Russian could be better. <laughs> because, <laughs> <laughs> not, not understanding the interpretation of something could be costly and that was something that was averted but my google translate didn't work for me that day and uh, thank god my architectural partner really caught it because 
yeah, it, it, it would have been something really big. Well, yeah. what, what's the most valuable lesson that you have learned since being in business, Beth? Um, oh, God, that's a good question. I almost feel like it's not a new lesson because it's a constant reminder is always get it in writing um no matter what so and it's in my contract if you send it to me via text it doesn't exist anything any approvals any denials any changes has to be um in email and i just wanted to piggyback to something that quinn was saying is that if your friends and family respect you they'll pay you so we not it's not free don't send me a text i'm not doing it leave me alone Come to oh, you, me. Don't, you, you don't want that text. What, what do you think of this? And I go, I don't. <laughs> or I just let it look mute. Oh, that doesn't look good. But <laughs> I can send you the link to my client questionnaire because I would never go to someone's job and right. expect something for free just because I work for myself. You have to give me the same amount of respect because to to so to something that you said, Gail, I can't go to Chase Mortgage mm. and say, "Oh, I did my friend a favor, so I didn't have to work on the people that were paying me." They would hang up on me. I would hang up on me. So <laughs> yeah. those are the things to to really think about. I think that's also um, that's probably a constant lesson too. Is that you got to treat yourself like a business, no matter what. Inea, what's the most valuable lesson that you have learned since being in business, since opening up your office? For me, definitely setting boundaries, uh, not responding to emails late at night, not accepting the text messages, outlining my contract to protect myself, and just overall maintaining control of the project. Based on my personality also too, I can be very sweet and they want to be my friend. And then it's not long before I'm getting texts at midnight or they're waking up in the middle of the night, or they're expecting me to work on the weekend. So for me personally, setting boundaries has been a huge lesson, and I'm still working on it, if I'm being honest. No, that's, there's always something we are all, uh, all working on. Um, all right, so we're about to wrap up here, but is there anything that you would like to share with the people out there watching us? Give them, I'll go through each of you, one, bit of advice that you would share? I'll start with Quinn first. I would say go the distance. Um, I think we've all talked about the benefit of um, education from the sense of it allowing us to learn more than we could have learned um, without it, uh, allowing it to expand our work, expand and open doors for us. Um, and so I feel like if you really operate in your lane, um, you could be successful in that way, in that sense, but also like staying in your lane and owning it. Like, um, I don't go out of here trying to be an electrician and trying to point out what I'm gonna do about plumbing and being like, oh, this is structural, we can knock down this wall. No, ma'am, no. So I think <laughs> that being in my lane and owning that allows me to see where I fit in the larger scope and picture of construction amongst the project team and, and in the industry. Uh, Inea, what about you? What's one word of advice or as it, you would tell, share? Being authentic. I started my business two years ago and I think I've done pretty well for how long it's been and being on my own just by being myself. And I think that sets you apart. There's tons of talent. There's enough projects and work for everyone. There's only one Beth. There's only one Joy, there's only one Quinn, and there's only one Inea. So I think just being okay being yourself and that attracts business and clients. That's cool. Beth? Um, I would say it's a mix of two things, and that is be professional and be yourself, which obviously piggy's back, piggybacks off what Inea was saying. I think it's really important. Um, and I even kind of address that in when I'm talking to a client. Um, during their consultation like this is an opportunity for us to determine our chemistry so who you're seeing right now during this consult is who you're going to get throughout i'm going to be professional i'm not here to be friends but we need to have um, a trusting and intimate relationship so we can give you the best project that we can so professional and being genuine wow and lovely joy oh boy <laughs> um, there's not just one thing for me go it, for it it's 
even though things get really, really wonderful and it's nice to have the travel and, you know, there are amazing perks, of course, never to forget you're in a service industry. That's our purpose. You know, you're there to perform a, a task and, you know, just don't try to always be laying out on the yacht and jumping in a helicopter thinking you're on vacation. You're still working. <laughs> Right. So, and then the second thing is support the people who you, who support you only shop at the places who support you. I've been going to the D and D building, the AD and D building, the A and D building 200 Lex for 30 years. And I have relationships with those vendors in particular who have good relationships with me, who went beyond the measure, who extended themselves. And it, you know, it, it just makes business a whole lot easier. So find people who support you, who support your business, who support your growth. And in turn, they are supported as well. And it ends up being a lovely machine because relationships are the backbone of our industry. This is true. And that's what a lot of people do forget that this is a service industry. It's not, let's make friends with everybody. It's not like they're cool. Don't worry about it. It's you're in business to make money. You're in business to run a business, period. So right. <laughs> remember that you're professional, right? But you have to remember you're performing a service. It isn't about ending up with people. You're there to perform a service, and people have to respect you as a professional, regardless of the circumstances. And sometimes you have to check people on this. But at the end of the day, know that you're a professional and it's a business well ladies i want to thank you so much i've learned so much from you um, and especially i like you all lead are you going to get your glass Sorry. Hmm? what are you getting your glass no i said i forgot for a second that we weren't the only ones <laughs> <laughs> no, I know, right? No, but it's fine. You know what's really great about this is that I just had a conversation the other day with um, a different designer, and they were saying you're not supposed to lead with, um, not, you're not supposed to talk about money with your client. And I was like, well, then how do you know what the budget is, and how do you know what you're dealing with? They're like, no, but if you lead with that, you're going to turn them off. I was like, well, then I'd rather them go away. I don't want them thinking I can do something. They're going to give me this big number and then they want to guesstimate and look. <laughs> and it's like, yes. So I feel refreshed that all of you talk about money, you lead with it, and you're right up front with it. That's so, this is how, this is the problem with the industry. There needs to be con some consistency here with that. And that's what I'm going to leave on. So, ladies. Thank you so very much. Cheers to you all and to those out there. Thank you for joining us. Until next time. Until next time. Thank you, everyone. Y'all were the best. Bye. <laughs>